So, thank you very much for coming, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we are very ha happy to welcome Mr. Urs Runa for um, this event. He will speak on the digitization in or of the banking industry. Um, just a quick, a couple of quick words about Mr. Rona. Um, he is currently the chairman of the board of directors of Credit Suisse Group AG, and he also chairs the chairman's and governance committee. Um, amongst other responsibilities, he is also on the board of directors of GlaxoSmithKline. And prior to joining Credit Suisse, he was actually the CEO of ProSieben Sat1, which some of you may have heard of. And um, I'd like to take this occasion as well um, to thank Credit Suisse for their generous sponsorship for this year's symposium. And I think we can generally say that a lot of great things we have achieved this, um, for this symposium would not be possible without your help. So thank you very much for this, and I'd like to welcome Mr. Ursula to the stage. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this very kind introduction. I think that now you also understand why they invited me, because Curtis Race is a sponsor of the <laughs> event. Um, um, I, I thought something like that would have had to, to be the case. Now it's a great pleasure for me, quite frankly, to be here at the LSC. Um, I've been here before, um, but it's the first time that I was invited uh, by the German Society, which uh, being Swiss uh, is a particular honor and pleasure for me. Uh, but as you have heard in the introduction, I have spent uh, five or six years of my life in Germany uh, when, when, uh, when I ran and built uh, Prozeben uh, in the uh, at the end of the 90s when I was a relatively young man. Uh, and I have very good memories of that, so I feel at least half uh, part of the German Society. Uh, and so it's a, it's a great pleasure to be here. The LSE is a very good venue for this year's uh, symposium. Um, when, you, when, you, um, when you go in, uh, the, one of the taglines there is Rerum Cognoscere Causas, or to know the causes of things, which I think is a, is a very, good, uh, very good starting point for our discussion about digitization and banking. Um, I think if there is one thing in financial services that we have to know about, apart from regulatory developments, which unfortunately you cannot predict, it is certainly uh, what happens to, uh, in the digital or disruptive space. Um, and I'm very much looking forward to uh, discussing this topic with you now in the next uh, half an hour or an hour or so. Now I have to make some reservations uh, at the outset. I'm not, I cannot claim I'm the ultimate expert on digital technology and digitization. I have spent a lot of time thinking about it because I have to, it's part of my job. Um, and I have my own hypothesis. Um, I'm personally convinced that uh, the digital disruption in this industry will be enormous and it will be much bigger than what the average uh, person in the financial services industry thinks. But it may not necessarily always be in those areas uh, that are particularly hot or hyped at the moment. It uh, may be in some areas much less sexy, but needless to say, as important as it would be, as it would be uh, be otherwise. Now, <coughs> which kind of innovation are we talking about? Uh, you can learn a lot about an industry when you understand the type of innovation that it entails. Really. There are plenty of industries, uh, pharmaceutical industries, one obviously, industry, consumer goods, where incremental innovation is a matter of survival and new features and products are launched on a really regular basis. I mean, in the pharmaceutical industry, innovation is is basically the key driver what drives valuation in this industry. Um, and in finance we have that part too. I mean the financial services industry has been extremely innovative in the past. Some people and cynics may say may sometimes they have been a bit too innovative uh, in developing new products uh, uh, but uh, also techniques, the way banking is, is actually done and run today is fundamentally different from what it was how, how it was done 20 years ago. But that is not the innovation we're talking about today. Um, what I would like to talk about today is disruptive innovation. And there is a significant disrupt uh, disruption opportunity in the financial services industry. Established players have been around for a very long time. Uh, they have often hired people who continue with the status quo. And I think it's probably fair to say that our industry has been, by and large, asleep at the wheel in terms of what was coming in the digital space. Um, I think so far the industry is now, has now realized that there is something coming and they have to catch up. But for a very long time, and this was actually counterintuitive, uh, the starting point was, oh, our industry is so highly regulated that it is unlikely that we will see the same kind of disruption that you would see in other industries. And that's fundamentally wrong. 
I mean, I could, so I could many many other industries have thought that too. Starting with taxi taxis to to take a a, a simple a simple uh, example, but it is it is actually counterintuitive to assume that in a services industry the only service industry that would not be disrupted would be banking. That's clearly not the case. Um, so uh, we will see that. But let me first, I mean, and just to give you maybe some guidance as to how I would like to do it, sort of a general overview about digitization. Then we'll talk a little bit about what we have been doing at Credit Suisse, what our thinking was, and then uh, we can have a good discussion about it, what you think will come, because you ultimately you will be a generation that will actually see the full impact of that. Uh, I will see it to a lesser extent, but you will basically, this will be your everyday life. Um, interestingly enough, uh, digitization in the banking industry has stopped in segments that most of the people deem uninteresting or unsexy, um, at least as far as the, the incumbents were concerned. Uh, and it will it is now in the process of whether it will get extremely serious uh, in the back office. It is in fact the back office that you know would initially give you the biggest potential for for uh, innovative for, and for disruptions. I mean, take take. Uh, um, Compliance, take uh, risk management, uh, uh, IT processes, etc. Uh, those are the areas where you have a lot of costs in the financial services industry today. In companies, I mean, a huge, huge part of our cost base is basically IT uh, and, 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 and risk management. You would be surprised if you knew how many people we employ uh, at Credit Suisse. We have, we have 50,000 people at Credit Suisse. And if you include all the consultants and everything we employ, probably almost half of it is IT driven. And we have thousands of people in risk management, in all areas of risk management, and compliance for that matter. So if you find a way as to how you can, with digital applications, improve your processes, make them more robust, faster, that will have a very, very significant impact on the cost base. And quite frankly, this is not something which is only good uh, and nice to do. It's actually indispensable to do it because at the same time, as you can see, other aspects of digitization will decrease your, your, current, uh, your current margins um, and you will have to f just face the reality that you have to do something very fundamental at your cost base if you want to keep your net margins more or less intact. This is dig and, and digitization clearly there is, um, is, is something that uh, will help on, on that way. I also believe that, you know, and we have seen disruptors in, those, in that space, and actually we work with some of these disruptors, uh, we do joint ventures with them. Uh, I'll give you one example, um, uh, for instance, we, we use uh, big data algorithm, uh, algorithms to, to detect unauthorized trading patterns. Uh, that may surprise you, but we have, we have done a test around a couple of, uh, I think about two years ago, and we, we downloaded a lot of information uh, where we knew you know, among the information that was in there, there was there were patterns of unauthorized uh, trading, because of actual cases we had, and we, we gave it to three different uh, startup fintech companies, some of them larger, some of them smaller, and said, well, can you find out some unusual behavior according to algorithm, and will you be able to find out uh, that something is wrong here uh, and detect unauthorized trading patterns? Two of the three companies detected in within less than 24 hours. Uh, and with one of the companies, uh, Palantir, we work actually quite closely now, and we use this as part of our risk management in the trading in the trading area. Uh, and it, quite clearly, because of the the, the, the sheer size of the data, um, this is something which no no you could never do if you if you had people actually doing this, uh, trying to do that. That is absolutely impossible. Um, and that's that's an area where you can see it already now. I will come to that some other examples uh, later on. Um, so, contrary to, to what many of, of my colleagues in banking say, I don't think that uh, the disruptors are actually as, as harmful. I think they are very welcome for the industry, and I think banks are well advised to actually, to actually work with them. Do I expect uh, uh, disruptors to come in and basically take the whole, the whole cake away from banks and create a completely different bank? That, I think, is rather unlikely uh, in the next couple of years, and I'll tell you why in a minute. Before I do that, let, let me talk a little bit about banking inno innovation in Germany. Uh, it's quite interesting that Germany has undergone quite an impressive development in the last couple of years, and I would say it's one of the most advanced uh, countries 
in European markets for, for banking innovation. We have a lot of fintech startups uh, in, in Berlin, in, in Hamburg, in, in, in Frankfurt, and indeed in Munich. Uh, we have about 250 fintech startups uh, in, in Germany, uh, and one of them, a uh, Forex Trader 360T, actually was, sub was then uh, ultimately acquired by the, by the Deutsche Börse. Uh, for 750 million last year, which is which show, tells you that uh, there is really a space for, for innovators to actually go into these markets and then and then and do something. Interestingly enough, for me, this is a case in point where, in, in fact, then the incumbent saw the potential, came in, and ultimately bought it at a very high price. But um, and I think that's a model that you will see more and more, uh, not only here in Europe but also in the U.S. Many of the U.S. banks have done that. Uh, we have done it. We have partnerships with others. And now uh, I'll tell you a little bit later what we will um, what we will do uh, more in that space uh, from an organizational point of view. Um, now, some of the characteristics of the German fintech uh, venture market are quite unique um, and uh, are quite interesting. Actually, most of them, uh, to a lot, or many of them, are in fact in the back office space, not client-facing activities. Um, that's uh, interesting. I think at the moment that's probably the more promising, promising part of it. Um, I also know fintech uh, fintech organizations that work on the client facing um, uh, side and try to come up with a completely new offering. That's a bit more difficult because there you also have to have the whole the whole uh, back end of it uh, of the relationship with the clients, the risk management, etc. That's much that's much that's much harder to do for a startup then just come up with one product that actually works for a particular purpose. Um, uh, but in total, I think the, the, the total investment in 2015 was over a billion, over a billion euros, if you include uh, now this very, very rich uh, exit that we have seen. In the UK, and we should talk a little bit about the UK as well, um, after the Silicon Valley, I think London has tried to become a cluster for fintech innovation. Um, <coughs> it, it, it is one of the most influential fintech clusters, uh, uh, and it has attracted over half a billion dollars uh, last year uh, for companies um, to to uh, to basically come up with new ideas in the fintech space. So far, I don't see, think we have seen extremely many companies that have come out and, and really dis disrupted us. But I mean, we are in the process uh, where this certainly will become more more prominent. And the question that you can ask yourself is where is actually digital disruption in banking heading at the moment or in, uh, at the wider sort of uh, in the next couple of years? I mean, the basic proposition of any disruptor, and when you talk to any of your friends who work in Silicon Valley or anywhere, is basically uh, relatively simple. A previously exclusive service is made available to a broad user audience in a more customer-friendly way and most importantly it is, offered, it is offered for a fraction of the original price. That basically is what every disruptor wants to do and wants to achieve and in banking that has quite severe consequences. First of all I think one, one of the things that digitization brings with it is uh, heightened uh, transparency comparability and the last point as I said is, uh, is uh, a lot much lower price. Those are three things that for a high margin industry are potentially dangerous because it brings down your margins by necessity. So when you hear about these, these things, so what incumbents usually do, they either go into total denial about, about the customer's desire for a better product or service and quite frankly there I'm convinced that's exactly what customers want and will want in the future uh, because they will have the transparency and the comparability. They will have it irrespective as to whether banks like it or not. Um, and if the industry itself does not actually see that and tries to overcome that, then it will get, into, get to a point like the music industry in the past or in a way also the media industry in many aspects of it where they simply say, well, actually we lost that one. That is something which you do not want to see uh, happen um, going forward and but I think the the pricing aspect of it and the transparency aspect of it, that's the one thing that will really drive ultimately the innovation uh, in banking because there's no point or no I think no credible assumption to be made that you can you can continue having high margins in an industry that is fully transparent banking was not fully transparent for not many many years services 
I mean, were not comparable really. And this digitization will change fundamentally, and that will have a huge impact on the whole model, on the pricing model, and on a lot of other things also. For, for the innovators, on the other hand, there is also a problem on their side. They don't have a banking license. And I think ultimately this could become a very limiting factor uh, for the industry. Uh, Financial, disrupt, uh, financial services disruptors have been quite clever in, in carving out certain niches of the value chain and say, well, we do that. Always being short of to providing services that would require a banking license. Be why? Because they do not want to get in that regulated area, and quite frankly, I can understand them. Sometimes you dream in an ideal world you would be outside the ambit of all the regulation, uh, which is not something which... Uh, which banks are typically known for. So for innovators, that's a clearly a limiting factor. There is something that they can do and there will be many things that they can't do, at least for the time being. If 10 years or 15 years from now, all these boundaries sort of melt away because regulators simply cannot regulate anymore because it will be even more and more difficult to determine where a transaction is originated from is a different story. But for the time being, I think it's a, it is a limiting factor for their business. And the regulators know that, and they are quite keen on trying to put uh, put some controls around that. Uh, consider, for instance, anti-money laundering legislation and other things, where obviously they want to be sure that you know they have they have controls over transactions. And typically, that comes with with uh, with a regulatory approach, where you know that regulated banks actually ultimately are responsible for for doing that. Uh, regulators have zero tolerance for non-compliance in these areas and that can even, uh, as we have seen in the case of Ripple Labs in the US, then result in uh, quite severe fines for startup companies that would not be able to to uh, provide that level of, uh, of quality. They, I think they had to pay about 700,000 US dollars for failing to report suspicious transactions. And that's, that, that's where you see where some of the limitations are. Some other challenges for the innovators are and the biggest chance paradoxically relates to their core strengths, their focus on specific customer pain points. That's what they basically are very good at. They say, well, we have one thing where we know clients want something else and we do that, but they do only that. And a single value model may be superior on a standalone basis, but that's normally not what uh, comprehensively addresses the, the needs and desires of clients. They want more than just that. And that, that I would say, will in a way pave the way for, for disruption for the time being. To a large extent, they will be able to commoditize a previously costly service to a much less costly service. But then in many, in many instances, there will be joint ventures that you will see of innovators or, uh, with, uh, with, with classic uh, banking companies uh, in order to for the banks, obviously, it's a way to, to improve the, their services. And for the innovators, it's a way to exit their business. I've seen, I've actually followed uh, most of the, of the fintech companies, of the bigger <coughs> ones, quite closely. And there are instances, I mean, Lending Club, for instance, was written up in all the newspapers. When you really look at the numbers of Lending Club now, after the IPO, they came in with a very high valuation. Valuation has come down significantly, very significantly. The book has go, grown bigger and the margins have come down. So it's, but they have not been able to basically attract that kind of scale where they get the economies of scale to really push, uh, to really push that business. Uh, and that was in many ways one of the most promising, promising, uh, I would say, ventures in the in the classic financial intermediation space. Now, what we have, what have we done? What have we done at Credit Suisse? And let me maybe explain a little bit what my thinking process was a couple of years ago and then afterwards we can have a discussion you can tell me what you think I did wrong or didn't get because I'm uh, I'm not your age anymore and I may have missed some of the high points so my starting point was the following I and I did exactly what I said one shouldn't do I started with the client facing side and I said well what will the next generation of clients want from a bank and what the kind of services would they like to have and what, how would they like to interact with banks? Is it credible uh, to assume that they would love to go and see their relationship manager in person, go to a bank or to a bank branch to make payments? Probably not. Nobody makes payments in that fashion anymore, uh, probably except people 65 plus who are used to doing that. So 
I, I looked at my own kids. Um, they are in 18 and 20 years old, my older ones. They don't go to a bank. They make all their payments electronically. They have a, a small custody account. They look at their, their uh, they look at their securities, but they would never they would never go to a bank anymore. Now this is there will always be people who have different requirements and will be different. But I thought what is really what is really what clients want in the future? I mean the same kinds of clients who grow up with Facebook kinds uh, clients that that grow up with Amazon where everything can be compared, where you have direct comparison. And so that they can define a little bit what you believe. And you have to, to make a guess what could happen. Now, the bigger question is, and that's the really billion dollar question, what are they prepared to pay for? Now, 80% of the services that banks traditionally deliver to a normal um, client, I'm not talking about the most sophisticated ultra high net worth client, uh, is um, you can get for free on the internet. Let's be frank about it. I mean, you will find model portfolios <coughs> on the internet, you will find tracker portfolios where you can track even the most sophisticated investors. You may find uh, risk model, uh, risk models that you can you can uh, find for free on the internet, etc., etc. So there will be many things you will get for free. Now it's hard to tell people, well, actually, if you bank with us, this is all not for free. You have to pay us a fee. For what we're doing for you. So what that means is you have to really think quite hard what is actually the add-on value that you create as a bank for which a client will be prepared to pay. <coughs> and I'm absolutely not negative about it. I think there is there is a lot of value that banks can deliver um, to clients um, in an environment where everything, where we are overshadowed by information, we do not have a scarcity information, we have an overflow of information, to, to be able to judge and assess information and to basically apply then a solution or to find a solution for a complex financial problem for a client is something which, which has a value. But what does that mean? It basically means you have to have people who can do that or you have to have a machine that can do it, like a Google search machine that can do that. Um, <coughs> And, uh, and then come up with the right solution. Um, and that is something which banks traditionally have not been very good at delivering. So in other words, when you think this through, you very quickly come to com some, com some conclusions. One is you have, to, you have to really think about what the digital offering should look like, and not just for the basic retail client to make payments, but also for the super sophisticated client. We have done that. Uh, I started the project about three, was it three or four years ago, called Future Lab outside the normal managerial lines. So it was directly under me with about 20 people. Uh, and the goal was try to find out what can happen to all our businesses we are in. How could they be disrupted and what would be an answer for the future, for the client of the future. They came up with a very a number of very, very good ideas. Um, among them, we then decided to, to build a beta version first of a digital private bank, which we did. A digital private bank for a sophisticated clientele. So, in other words, the, the billionaire who sits uh, somewhere in Asia uh, at his swimming pool and would like to check his global positions, irrespective as to where they are booked, who wants to be able to to risk management to risk manage uh, his assets and who wants to be able to get the best expert opinions, <coughs> research, and is able to also communicate by the push of the button with the relationship manager he would know. We have built that machine, it actually works. Um, uh, and we have introduced it in Asia. Um, we are now at, I would say, the, the, the point two point, two point 2.0 or 3.0 version. We have, a, we have a, 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 a similar, slightly different version in Switzerland now, that, which is in use, which is actually quite, uh, quite convenient. Um, so that's one thing we did, and I think this will, will be rolled out further. The ultimate goal is that, that uh, irrespective as to where you book or bank with Credit Suisse all over the world, even in different positions, you basically have a comprehensive view on what you do, and you get access to 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 the best information. We'll then also have a couple of uh, quite uh, quite interesting or sexy features, like uh, I would say that you create communities among among uh, sophisticated clients. Uh, co-investment opportunities and so forth. So that's all in the in the ultimate build out. That's one thing. And the second thing I did is I said, well, I have to find somebody who can help me 
in this thinking process, and I, I then, um, uh, you know, found uh, a German professor for robotics who is in the Silicon Valley and is uh, actually quite well known, um, not for having recreated the banking services industry, not yet, but for having uh, created a car that drives without a driver, the driver was called Sebastian Thun, he professor, was a professor at Stanford, and he was the founder of Google X. Uh, I has done uh, many innovations, he now, he now has started an online university, which I think by now has about 200,000 uh, 200, uh, uh, students. And he is an extremely creative man. I did not want him. I didn't want to build a robotic bank, and I have spent hours with him, basically thinking about the question: what What will clients of the future generation want? And the other question is: um, How can you disrupt the banking business? And we have a, ultimately, and we have had many ideas, hypotheses. Some of them we have followed on. Um, others we have uh, we have then thrown away again. But we will continue on that path, and uh, we will we will going forward. We will create a uh, a, a lab, sort of a, a Credit Suisse lab in the Silicon Valley, with a couple of young people, and we'll give them one mandate and tell them try to disrupt our existing model. You have six months or twelve months. There's a certain amount of money you have to do. Come up with ideas as to how you would do it, and maybe on the way you may also want to create a new model for an affluent bank. For, affluent, for a bank for affluent clients. Why would I be interested in that? I can tell you why I would be interested in that. If, because if you can solve that problem and you find you find the right solution as to how clients tick and will tick in the future, you will be able to very rapidly uh, gain market shares or basically build up and develop new markets. And that is some, what I think banking will be all about in the future. And it will be very important that you that you are there because if you're f if you're faster than the others, you may get an over proportional part of that uh, of that market, which can be very attractive. So those are things we are currently doing. Uh, do I think we have we have found all the right solutions? No, I have. I don't think so. Um, this is a process. It's an ongoing process, and it is a difficult process. I would I would be remiss if I didn't uh, also mention that. Now, I may be excited and enthusiastic about the potential and the possibilities, and we'll do that in every instance. I mean, we'll, have, we'll, have, we'll do a lot of big data and, and technology-driven <coughs> innovation now in compliance, in, in risk management, in other areas, and we'll do more and more and more because we have to. But the client-facing side, which in a way is the, is, the, is the most interesting part, if you can resolve that problem, that will really give you an edge over your competitors. And that's not so simple to do it, but I think there are ways as to how we can do it, and we have a very, uh, we have a very strong core competence in, in wealth management, particularly for the for the high net worth individuals and the ultra high net worth individuals. And there, I think we will be. I would expect we are further advanced than the others in, in how we address and tackle these issues. So I hope it stays that way. Um, it's a it's an interesting journey, and we will continue on on that. But we have to find models that work differently. One of my learning has been, for instance. If you bring it into your existing organization, you will fail, most likely. Innova to do disruptive innovation within an incumbent is a bit like uh, having the inmates run the asylum or have the turkeys vote for Christmas. It just doesn't work, because very quickly people will realize, well, actually, if I think that through, it may mean that at the end of the process it doesn't need me anymore. That's usually not a very appealing uh, uh, proposition to start with. And so real disruption, you have to do outside. That's something which, which I learned from Sebastian um, at, uh, at Google X. They, and Google is a very open, normally open and transparent company. At Google X, where there is the secret laboratory where they invented all these crazy things, there was one rule. You don't talk to anybody within the organization about new, new uh, products or, or things you design, because only once it is done, and finish, then you do that because you otherwise it will immediately you will have hundred people who will come and say it doesn't work, and quite frankly in banking you will have a couple of hundred people who will tell you it doesn't work, <laughs> uh, and that's before you started talking to regulators. But um, I think the I think the the the, uh, the possibilities and uh, the opportunities are really large, and the challenges are large too, and the f the fundamental problem is is uh, for banks at the moment is speed. There are certain things you absolutely have to do. If you do not have a digital offering as a bank, you will be gone in 10 years. I guarantee you that. 
because yeah, because of cost pr cost pressures and because others will have do it uh, will, will have it. Uh, margins are under huge pressure in this an econ economic environment. This is particularly the case uh, unless you are able to really drastically reduce the cost base, and you have to do that through innovation. You will you will fail. Uh, there's no question about it. But this is just this is what you absolutely have to. That's the minimum minimum thing. If you want to grow your business and go into enter into new markets, you have to come up with additional guys, ideas, new ideas, and that uh, then is the much harder part, but maybe also the more fun part. And maybe if I could stimulate one or two of you to actually think about these things and come up with great ideas, we are always very appreciative, and um, and uh, we are more than happy to to work with people actually who do that. I think that's the way forward. And. Uh, the financial services industry is, a, is an interesting industry. It will remain an interesting industry. It will be probably run a bit differently than it were used to it. But in the end, at the end of the day, financial intermediation is extremely important. It's an extremely important driver also for growth, for growth uh, in the economy. And therefore, we should use uh, those uh, uh, possibilities. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Luna. Um, I think we will pass on the microphone because I think it's easier to hear for the people in the background. Um, do we have any questions from the audience to start with for Mr. Rohn? I think he gave us a lot of insight um, where we could challenge his views or agree with him, depending. Yes. Um, yeah, if you, I think if you stand up, it's fine. Uh, hey, uh, my name is Fabian. Um, I'm a management student here at LSE. Uh, I'm from Germany, and uh, well, thank you for your speech. Um, so my question is related to what you said about um, the cost aspect or the opportunities to reduce costs through digitization. Um, so my understanding is that through automate, uh, like to automate uh, by automating. Um, back end processes you can yes you can reduce cost but aren't you afraid that in the long run you need to really innovate on the front end because my understanding is that a lot of fintechs are actually trying to take away the front end and the user experience from the bank so that the bank in the end might end up only handling the processes in the in the back end i think you have to do both quite frankly uh, i mean the, the, as i said the, some of the things are simply indispensable. You absolutely have to do it, otherwise you will be, you will disappear like Nokia disappeared, or you will, or or and, and the other things you will have to do. On the front end side, I'm a bit less skeptical, quite frankly. I mean, a lot of these, I mean, I've tested some of these, these applications, including Lending Club, for instance. Uh, but you know, you s what what is really in, what, what is intriguing is to to have a better on first of all. To have a better understanding of what your clients want, there are ways and means as to how you can do that. I mean, Amazon basically always checks client satisfaction, for instance, something which banks never do. We, do, we have an idea about. I can say, well, I only meet I only meet happy clients, so we must be must be very good. That's not the reality, right? Actually, I also meet some unhappy clients from time to time, <laughs> but um, they usually didn't write me. Um, but um, <laughs> or, <soon do>. <laughs> <laughs> or shout at me. <laughs> yeah. uh, no, but but I mean, there are ways as to how you can drastically increase or improve your know your your knowledge or, uh, about what clients really want and what they think about your service, and that will ultimately lead to a better to a better service. So the the the, the client facing side is, is 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 equally important, and and actually it's the more attractive part to do it. I think it's the harder part for disruptors to uh, disruptors to be to really be successful. The cost part is a relatively simple one. I mean, Lending Club has a book of I think of about 50 billion now, and last time I checked, I think they had three or four people in credit risk management. <laughs> That's pretty remarkable. I mean, we have um, the rest they do with big data and big data applications, very sophisticated tools. Uh -huh. So far, it seems to have worked. I mean, we'll see how it does on the stress conditions. But I can tell you, we have a couple of thousand people great risk management. If I can reduce that by by half or sixty percent or seventy percent, I would do it. I would do it. And take another very almost seems seems a bit uh, simplistic example. Opening of a bank account. 
This is a laborious process that sometimes takes a couple of weeks in banks, depending on, on how, uh, you know, the clients. I'm absolutely convinced there must be a way that you can do this in digital fashion, much faster, more secure, you can store everything, there's no question as to whether people have ticked the right box and answered the right questions, you have evidence of that. And uh, you can you can design that process in a way that you cannot go to the next step unless you actually f completely fill out these forms. That will take you a fraction of the time. It will be much better, and it will increase uh, increase also compliance in in this area. I can tell you, I know what the failure rates are of account opening account openings at our bank, and you would not want to know this question. I'm pretty certain that we are not worse than other banks, but it's. The, 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 the amount of time and labor that goes in is enormous, something which easily should be, you should be able to do uh, digitally going forward. And this will come, I mean, there's no question. Uh, and we have, we have some applications now that we have designed. The whole thing about the standard terms and conditions of banks, you can do in a much different way. I think about, about uh, using, I mean, we have done that in our digital private bank, for instance, started, started to, to, to apply um, Gaming, uh, gaming techniques to to educate people. You know, there, as you know, on the MiFID two in, in Europe and, and some other legislation, you you differentiate between uh, experienced clients and not so experienced clients, depending on what they know and what their background is, also also what their asset base is. Now, you have to test that. They have to make sure that clients understand what they invest in. Now, you can if you if you find a way as to how you can do that. Elect digitally on the internet that you know clients first do a game then they do a test um, where they start to understand new products in a better fashion you will have evidence that you basically that you taught people uh, and educated them about certain certain products um, that uh, that will then help you getting uh, getting these issues issues resolved in a good way those are things that are quite attractive we have tested it with, with people and and uh, I'm convinced that uh, this will this will um, work actually quite nice. Those other things uh, we, we are focusing on. But as you, as you rightly point out, you have to do both. If you only do the cost part, that may may be enough for the next couple of years, but it may not be enough in the long term. That's uh, there's no question about it. I mean, the question you should ask yourself is: well, is it possible to build a bank with 20 people? I mean, a big bank with 20 people and a lot of technology. Maybe that's where we end up. I don't know. Yeah. Hi, Marcus Stoff, Imperial in Germany. Um, you mentioned that the innovation in the fintech industry is outside the big banks, which I think is absolutely right. You mentioned Deutsche Boyser acquiring a fintech company. Why is it that the big banks are watching this development? They might spend IT. Why is it not that all the large banks evolve into a kind of private equity style hype acquiring 20, 30, 40 percent in fintechs for a million and not spending three quarters of a billion once it's all developed? Well, actually, the, I, th I think the honest truth is they probably do both. Um, we, have to, we have these kind of, 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 of venture funds. Um, all the banks have, to have that too. I mean, UBS is sponsoring uh, even a cluster here in London. Uh, the failure rate is extremely high. That's a bit the problem. Like, <coughs> as you would find in most uh, early, early, uh, early venture funds, um, that's part of the problem. When we see when we see things that we find interesting, it could very well be that we go in relatively early and take a stake there. Uh, not because we think we want to make a big profit of, of an exit, rather that we actually that we have uh, certain strings attached to that product and to those services so that we can we can have it in house. I think that's the art to do it. But you, the only thing I would warn about is you should not try to do innovation within the big organization or the big IT. That's almost impossible to be done. The thinking is completely different. Uh, um, and, and this is not because the people who actually run big IT departments are, are, are less, less smart or less intelligent. It's a different job. They have to make sure that you know, very complex IT infrastructures and, uh, and processes actually work and work 24 hours a day with uh, a zero, zero uh, tolerance for any kind of mistakes. Uh, that's a completely different setup than to think about as to how you could disrupt certain things. But you have to do both. I mean, one, one, one thing we try to do is, is actually, that's why I'm, I was very much in favor of doing a sort of a Credit Suisse lab in Silicon Valley. It's a bit further away, 
it's a, I'm not saying it's a playground, but it, it's, it's a way where people can actually think very freely also about ideas that maybe if they were presented to me at the parody plots in Zurich, I'd say, well, whatever, but you know, this is the regulation, you can't do this and you can't do that. There, I think you will probably come to better solutions in the end if you have that freedom to do that. And that's what, I mean, it's not something which, which I invented. I mean, I know that other banks do similar things. Uh, it's just, I think in the, in the end, it very much hinges on finding the right people who supervise that, who run that. Now, with Sebastian too, we have somebody who can be extremely helpful because he knows the people, he knows the industry there, and you know, and he's a very good thinker. That's what you need to. I have one question myself. Um, so, hearing what you said about what the future of banking might look like, and thinking of how much Siri on the iPhone already can do, what how, what will the future banker look like? <laughs> Interesting question. Like I don't know. <laughs> I mean. Do we mean, or you ask me, does he have to wear a suit if he goes to work? No, no, but is he going to be a, a computer programmer, or no. is he, um, are, w what changes are we going to see if... I don't think so. I mean, certainly not the computer programmer. In the end, you know, if you have money or assets, you want, I, I would expect that people will still want to have somebody on the other side who can talk to, they think they understand them, and they will have complex complex uh, problems. I mean, uh, well, take, a, take a German SME company owner who has three kids. One will, be in, will, uh, will ultimately end up in the business. The other two don't want to be in the business. You have to find a way as to have you do this. If you can do the, 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 the transition to the next generation in a way which basically allows the one, the one child to, to actually run the business, what can banks provide in terms of financing in that, in that context? Or you have other company. You have people who have very complex financial needs in a pre-IPO space. How can you do that? That you cannot simply do by by applying some kind of uh, algorithm. So you will always have to have people have judgment. But I think will change is you will have much more specialists and much less people who who uh, basically provide high-level uh, relationship or, or, or concierge services. I mean, you will have to have people who really understand. Uh, also complex financial problems and are able to, to find solutions for that. And that will, in my opinion, will, will, will be a fundamental change in the wealth and asset management business. That there I think that you will see different people uh, in, in, in those organizations compared to what you have seen in the past. All right, so. um, yeah. One question, um, Cornelius Steele. So you mentioned earlier that Sebastian Trun was one of the people that you got to join Credit Suisse, and I believe he's on the board of directors of Credit Suisse. I've spoken to a few other CEOs, and they tell me that in, you know, when you talk about digitalization and you talk about these entrepreneurs, it's very, very hard to get them to join a bank. It yes. usually fails just based on the fact that they will have to wear suits. They don't want to wear suits. So if we have you know, entrepreneurs outside, for example, if you're Credit Suisse in Silicon Valley, and it's hard for them to join Credit Suisse. So how are you then going to establish this kind of spirit of entrepreneurship within Credit Suisse, which is also critical, you know, as, as well as you know, the spirit outside of Credit Suisse? First of all, I would claim that Credit Suisse probably among the banks has, been, has had the reputation in the past of being pretty um, entrepreneurial. That was a big, big distinguishing factor. It basically was ultimately the reason why I joined Credit Suisse and would not have joined another bank. At least not in Switzerland. <laughs> um, <laughs> if I may say so. Um, uh, so that's that's that for starters. Number two, I don't I don't require somebody to wear a suit in the boardroom if he doesn't wear suits <laughs> because it's irrelevant. I, 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 I want people to uh, I want people there because of their brain, not because of the, what they what they wear. I mean that's number two. Uh, number three, I don't think it's fundamentally important that you have these people on the board. It's important that you have them in some capacity that they can provide what they are best at. So there are many ways as well I can do it. They can be on the an advisory board, they can be they can be senior advisors to you, you find some other mechanism, you set up a a, a, a small lab somewhere. That's I think ultimately much more important than to have to have them on the board. I mean, it's a pain to be in, in board meetings or in risk committee meetings for for people because you will be sitting there for 10 hours, you have to be extremely concentrated, you have to 
to, to, to talk about a lot of things that maybe is not what you usually do for, for your living. So that's hard. It's very hard to find people in that space who would like to join banks. Apart from the fact that it's generally quite hard to find people who want to sit on bank boards these days for other reasons. But, uh, but uh, no, this is absolutely true. But I mean, I mean, if you cannot overcome that issue and you don't find some sort of solution, then maybe you should ask yourself some other questions too. I mean, if you know that you have a, you have a deficiency there, you have a necessity or a requirement for something, then you have to come up with some creative solutions that you can do it. I mean, that's, that I think is essential. Then how it ultimately looks like, I think, is, 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 is of much less straightforward. Um, my name is Stephen Martin. Um, I, I had a quick question. What you mostly talk about in fintech is very much in the retail banking space. I was uh, wondering what your views are on kind of developments, what you're expecting in the more corporate banking. Um, it's a very good question. I mean, when you did this future lab project at, at Credit Suisse, we also looked at obviously all, all looked the entire space of the businesses we were in. Um, and you know, I was, <laughs> I shouldn't say that because there's so many investment bankers who sit here. <laughs> but um, I, at the time, I, my, my hypothesis was I cannot imagine that 10 years from now you would still have the flying investment bankers with, with the briefcases that go and visit clients. There must be some other way as to how you can, uh, you can create that same kind of, of band relationship with your clients. I mean, you may, do, may, you may be doing it completely differently. Uh, what will not change, however, and that's the, that's the point I'm, I, I forgot to mention before, and that has also been part of my hypothesis. Ultimately, uh, you have to find a way as to how you create a band of trust between a client who actually gives you money, or like, deposits money on your bank, or a client uh, who wants to, uh, who requires a service from you. And the, the, the question is, is not if you need that or not. You will need that. Nobody will bank with a bank if he doesn't have trust in that bank or that organization. Or well, nobody will hire an attorney if he doesn't trust the guy uh, that he is able to do to perform what, what you want him to perform. The question is, how do you create that band? And my, uh, my assumption or my ingoing hypothesis would be that may be different for the future generation than it was in the past. In the past, perhaps people liked the fact that they could travel to Zurich, they would meet their relationship manager, they would have lunch with the relationship manager, they would then the relationship manager would present them the positions, talk to them about you know the assets that they had, what how they developed, what the performance was, etc. That was a way to build up a relationship and over years they said maybe future generations want that differently. They don't care if it's Mr. Mayo or Mr. Müller. Maybe they have more institutionalized uh, requirements of trust. They trust a company because they believe that company is run properly or is run by honest people or whatever. I mean, and that's that's the, the, the more interesting question. But you will see that also in the corporate space, in the advisory business, certainly. But think about uh, corporate lending too. Maybe the way you, you find people who will lend may be different for borrowers. I mean, that's basically what peer, the peer lending uh, started, where you had crowdfunding, etc. The only thing I would say is, given the enormous the enormous size of, of, of credit requirements that you have globally, the, what you see at the moment is still a small fraction that actually goes into that market. All the, when all the peer to peer lending activities combined are a fraction of the total market. Yeah, now does that change fundamentally going forward? I have my doubts. And, and there is where I think sort of some of the regulation, the protection that regulation also affords, will come into play. I mean, you will think twice about who you deal with. Uh, if you don't know what the capital position of the institution is, if, if, if actually you, 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 you give them money or, or you deposit money with them. And that is, that is an area where I think there will be, um, where we have not really seen the ultimate solution. But there will, I, there's no doubt in my mind that you know, all aspects of, of banking will, will, over time, will change. And, and most, of the, most of, the, of the spaces that we have seen uh, including the advisory business in particular, will, I think will undergo fundamental changes. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, you mentioned the regulators quite a lot in your talk. And as you know, Sorry, I apologize for that. <laughs> 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 um, my question is actually about it, so actually, yeah, I have to apologize. Uh, so you know, President Juncker is trying to achieve like the digital single market in the EU, and I just was wondering what do you think are the main barriers that are still have to be 
tackle to actually achieve that also in terms of financial services? So you mean the digital financial services market? Yeah. Um, ultimately, it's the politicians in Brussels that will prevent it. Because they are, they are, they are way, too, way, way too, um, uh, too slow for that. Um, if you think about it, uh, they are not talking about the, the, the European Capital Union. This is it. This is, and I promised you, this will be a 15-year project until you will see the first, the first real impact that it will have. I don't think they will be able to do it because the starting point is wrong. They will say, what do we have to do from a regulatory point of view to allow a digital financial uh, market in, in the Europe? And then they will come up with 20,000 pages. I'm not kidding. That's what they do. Believe me, the single rule book in the EU is 20,000 pages. Mr. Enria is proud of that. <laughs> you can ask him. And I must say, it, 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 it is impressive that you can produce 20,000 pages in 18 months. But if you have to implement it as a bank, it's actually quite cumbersome. And, and that's why I'm, I'm extremely, extremely pessimistic about being able to do that quickly. Because as soon as you do it, and it works, people will say, well, then now what do I have to do to protect investors? What do we have to do to make sure that it doesn't go off limits? And they will come up with a lot of, of regulation, uh, and this will take a long, long time. So, Unfortunately, but I think it would be an excellent idea. Actually, I thought about that too. Uh, if there wasn't a way to actually do a digital securitization market in in the, in the EU, that would could be much faster than what they are trying trying to do with the capital union, uh, capital markets union, uh, because that that could really potentially stimulate growth in Europe, which is, is badly needed. But I can tell you this. Unfortunately, maybe maybe you are, maybe you should go there. Yeah, You're yeah, more successful than we are. But it, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a very, very good idea. I think the, to, to actually do it is not, will not be simple, will not be trivial. You may be able to do that in a, you know, in a small space, but if you want to really do it as it has a market impact, that you, know, that you end up in a situation where not 80% of all the credits are on bank balance sheets, but are in the capital market, like in the US, where 80% is in the capital market and 20% is on bank balance sheets. If we could try to move more towards that direction in Europe, that would be extremely helpful for Europe and it would stimulate uh, growth enormously, in my opinion. But um, I'm afraid it will take a couple of years until we are there. But try it. I will try it. <laughs> so, thank you very much. I think that's five o'clock. I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> yeah, so thank you very much. We have a little something for you. <laughs> A little selection of tea bags. Oh, tea bags. Thank, yeah. you, thank you very much. <laughs>